Good evening. Welcome to Portland Bible Church. We're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Thank you so much for joining us. Those who are here live in person, those who are live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page, also those who will be watching later on YouTube. For the YouTube, go to the PortlandBibleChurch.com website. At the top of the homepage, it has services. There's a drop-down menu there. And there's a link to YouTube so you can uh, get that information if you desire to follow with us afterwards. Uh, the material for our studies is usually found in the doctrine section. And for this one, we'll find it in the doctrine section there where it says uh, the... Uh, um, <laughs> I can remember what we're teaching here. Yeah, leadership, leadership part one. Sorry about that. Uh, we're studying leadership in the Old Testament. We're finishing up with the kings. And so we were looking at uh, Hezekiah, and we're going to look at Josiah. So we kind of got hung up with Hezekiah because he's one of the good guys, one of the great leaders, and uh, had a few f failures. We're going to look at the failures tonight, but he had some great times at one of the greatest, uh, actually, Passovers that uh, was held in Israel in the southern kingdom of Judah uh, since the time of Solomon. So that's pretty good, uh, pretty good accolade to him with regard to the Passover. In fact, they had so much uh, enjoyment and celebration, they did it for another seven days. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days after the uh, day of Passover, and then they uh, they actually started uh, they started it a week late. Uh, and then they went for two weeks, uh, so it was kind of a, a real exciting thing. So we looked at those things. Uh, we looked at the fact that he destroyed many of the, well, almost all of the pagan altars in the high places, and even that brazen serpent that they had saved all these years. And, of course, that was what Moses had put up in the wilderness at the behest of God to uh, have them look to that serpent dead on the pole in bronze. And uh, that, of course, in the New Testament was a reference back to the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. But they actually ended up worshiping that thing, and so it became an icon, and so uh, Hezekiah melted that thing down. So he did a great job in getting rid of all of the idolatry at his time, and so uh, at least uh, for the moment, the nation seemed to be back on the right foot, that is the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, of course, is uh, uh, definitely on the way out, and of course, Sennacherib of Assyria came and uh, took them away into uh, the uh, area of Assyria. And so the Northern Kingdom was pretty much finished in 722. But we're coming down the home stretch here for the Southern Kingdom. They, they were destroyed and carried away to Babylon in 586 BC. So we're somewhere just, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it south or north of 720, 713, somewhere like that, uh, BC. So that's what we're looking at this evening. So keep in mind our classes are tonight, Thursday at 7 o'clock. After our class this evening, we have some time for prayer. So if you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgiving, please give us a call or uh, write to us and we'll be sure to get your prayer request on our agenda for Thursday night. That's our night for prayer time. On Sunday, we have class at 10 o'clock in the morning and 11.15. We take a little break in between uh, for some refreshments. And then after the second service, we sing about a half hour of the great hymns of the church. So hopefully some of you can join with us if you're in the area and be a part of our fellowship and enjoy the singing of those great, great old hymns. Some of them seem to be lost on the churches today with the modern uh, Christian music. Some of it's okay, but I prefer basically the great old hymns of the church. So uh, we also have a class on well, Wednesday at 2 o'clock right here. My wife Judy is doing a ladies' Bible study, and she just started the uh, seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. These, of course, were literal churches in the day that John wrote to them, but also we believe that they represent types of churches all through the church age. And so if that be true, then uh, we are certainly in the lazy, I call it the lazy period, which is the church of Laodicea. They were lukewarm, just uh, not even hot or cold. They were just lukewarm. So the Lord said, I think I'll spit you out of my mouth. That's kind of what he thinks of the churches that aren't teaching the word of God. And unfortunately, it seems like we have quite a few of those today. Okay, I think we all have our cell phones off. Appreciate that. And uh, do remember that we have communion this Sunday. So if you have your matzah, 
or your uh, grape juice, you can join with us and have the elements of communion to join with us. One other announcement, if you uh, need to get medication that is unavailable to you, uh, through any other means, I discovered that there's a place you can get medication for whatever you need, and that's at something called MyFreeDoctor.com. So MyFreeDoctor.com, if you need medication and no one will get it for you, you can get that medication there for your particular needs. I think that's all the announcements that I have, and so uh, we always take a few moments at the beginning of each of our Bible studies to make sure that we're in fellowship. The means to do that, we believe, are confessing any personal sins that we have, whether they're mental sins or verbal sins or some type of overt sin. The Holy Spirit brings these to our remembrance so that we can acknowledge them to God the Father, confess them. The New Testament passage in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we, as believers, confess our sins, that is, name, cite, or agree with them, uh, and do that to God, uh, God the Father, basically, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That picks up the ones that we did not know or the ones we've just forgotten, as well as the ones that we specifically name. And so the Father, of course, uh, forgives us, not just because we confess, but because Christ died for every sins, for every member of the human race, past, present, and future. So we're simply citing the uh, judicial court case, God the Father versus the human race, and uh, we were condemned to death. But because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, uh, we uh, opt out of death and eternal life if it's given to us by faith in Christ alone. Well, uh, that's uh, what we need to do. So we take a moment or two for silent prayer, and then I'll close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever, that gives us nourishment and understanding concerning who and what you are, your plan for us, our time in this life, and our destiny with your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you've provided in the past, all that you continue to provide for us, and the access that we have to your very presence, Father, through the work of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We pray now as we study these passages dealing with leadership, and the principles that we can glean from them, that, we, that you would encourage, challenge, and motivate us by the things that we study. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has said, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this evening to 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. We've been studying the doctrine of leadership for a number of weeks, and we've gone through a litany of Old Testament saints, really starting with Abel, uh, many of them listed, of course, in the book of Hebrews in the roll call of the honor, the honor roll, we might say, of saints and the great things that they did in faith. Sometimes it's called the faith chapter because all of these individuals live their lives by faith. And we have all of these men, plus many others that are listed uh, elsewhere. And, of course, we have the record of the kings of Israel, Saul, David, and Solomon, the first three before the divided kingdom. And then the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah comprised just of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So I got the name of Judah, even though all of Israel was still part of Israel, but it was divided. The kings that ruled in the northern kingdom, not one did a good job. They were all, as we say in Sunday school for the kids, they were all bad kings. In the southern kingdom, we had eight uh, out of 20 
that were good. So even there, we didn't have a, a hundred percent, but we did have some who did a marvelous job. And we've come to that king, Hezekiah, and then finally Josiah, possibly the greatest king in Israel, even though usually David is considered the greatest king uh, because he confessed his sin. It wasn't that he didn't have sin. We all have sin. We have sin natures, and therefore we commit sin. But we do have an advocate with the Father for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, of course, God pardoned, anticipating the work of the Messiah, yet future. And that was done through the sacrificial system under the Mosaic Covenant. So we have all of these Old Testament saints, and particularly those who were in authority and had leadership. So we come down to Hezekiah. We've noted a great many things about Hezekiah already and others that we could. We noted the fact that if you are interested in discussing or studying the works of Hezekiah, uh, the, the publication in the Bible is in Second Chronicles. There are four chapters there, 29, 30, 31, and 32 in Second Chronicles. In Second Kings, it's three chapters, 18, 19, 19 and 20, and in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, 36, 37, and 38. So there's quite a bit of material discussing what Hezekiah did. There's quite a bit of overlap, but there is information in each of these, uh, the Chronicles, the Kings, and Isaiah, that is not found in the others. So it kind of reminds me of what uh, one pastor said one time. In fact, I think they wrote a book, Life of Christ in Stereo, and uh, I think Dr. Rodmacher had a part in that as well. And it said that, you know, the Gospels, you can take all the four Gospels, and if you put them all together and synchronize them, try to insert the verses from each of the four books, you can actually have one full presentation and so they called it the life of Christ in stereo because that way you get the four gospels consecutively now some passages do overlap but the things that are missing in one are found in another and so you get the whole picture quadraphonic sound with the four gospels it might be said that uh, we have at least uh, three speakers here and that is the first uh, the, the second kings the, who wrote second kings and then the chronicle uh chronicle in second chronicles and then the prophet isaiah so we have three voices describing the same events to some extent or the other so it is interesting that uh, there's much much written about these individuals hezekiah and as we're going to study a little later josiah and so when we come over here to this particular section in second kings uh we're looking here at the next increment and basically we have the prayer of Hezekiah, we have the victories of Hezekiah, and we have the failures of Hezekiah. So those are the things that we're going to study. Uh, if you have your notes, we're actually here on, uh, let's see, this is page 10. So someone said page 10. We have 11 pages going through uh, Josiah. So we're getting to the end, but we've had quite a bit of information already. If you want that printed material or you want to follow along, you can go to the website and at the Bible dot, at PortlandBibleChurch.com, uh, look at the doctrine section and look up uh, Leadership Part 1, and you'll have those 11 pages there so you can follow along and have all the scripture. So I do give the scripture uh, as we're teaching, but uh, if you want all of the information that we've already covered, there, you'll find it there. Now, in this particular section, we're looking, if you want, down there <clears throat> on page 10 at letter I. Letter I, which says, both he and Isaiah the prophet prayed about this coming siege. And God delivered Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the Assyrians and their allies by great miraculous victory. This is actually the second time uh, Assyria, came, uh, Assyria came at them uh, shortly after the northern kingdom was uh, taken. And of course, uh, they, uh, uh, they, were, they repulsed that. And then again, they came later as a second time. And of course, at that time, uh, they were delivered once again in a rather miraculous way that we're going to see. So we have this passage that we find, and it's over there in 2 Kings 19. Now, I'm going to look at each of the passages in the various books and show how there's an overlap. Again, you'd have to read all the chapters to get the full flavor, if you please, but I have limited time, so I want to cover those that were going to be particularly germane. So in chapter 19, actually starting in verse 5, it says, so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, 
do not fear, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard which, with which your servants, the king of Assyria, have blasphemed me. Now, we studied last time that uh, the king of Assyria is a fellow by the name of uh, Sennacherib, and he has three generals, and the lead general is a guy by the name of Rabshakeh. And he came and just was a, a filthy mouth in terms of coming before the people of Israel, telling them that their doom was going to be that they ate their own excrement, they drank, drank their own urine, and don't listen to Hezekiah. He's talking about a deliverance from his God, and none of the gods of any of the nations we've conquered had any help for those people, and neither will your God. So they were blaspheming God. And so uh, basically, uh, the uh, prophet Isaiah says, don't be afraid. And again, the prophet here, I guess we can make an application, if you want, to the pastors today, those pastors such as myself, who are telling us in the face of adversity, fear not. Do not fear. The scripture is clear over and over. Fear thou not. I am with thee, God says. And here he says, don't be afraid of what you have heard, uh, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. And then Rabshakeh, his major general, returned and found the king of Assyria fighting in Lebanon. For he, was the, uh, for he had heard that the king had left this location, Libna. At any rate, we see this is the precursor to this. And so we go over to chapter 19 of 2 Kings in verse 14. It says, Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. The message, of course, was don't listen to Hezekiah. Uh, you guys are doomed. And, of course, all the negative, uh, horrible things that Rob Shaka said. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Look what they've done to you, Lord. So he says to the Lord, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who art enthroned above the Cherubim, thou art the God, thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thy ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thy eyes, O Lord, and see, and listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria, now notice kings, uh, there are a number of other peoples, groups, uh, kings apparently, that are coming along with Assyria. It sounds familiar, sounds uh, terribly like what we have today when so many nations surround Israel and they all hate Israel and it's almost a, uh, a harbinger of things that will happen during the future tribulation when all the nations of the world will gang up on Israel during the tribulation time and of course uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his return will deliver them at that second advent. Again, at the end of the kingdom, there will be an attempt by Satan of those people during the millennial kingdom who have rejected Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who will once again attack Jerusalem. So this is a, a recurring saga throughout the Bible and throughout the future, as we see, and they're never going to win, and they always attempt to do it. From time to time, when Israel is weak, when Israel fails to be obedient to God, then, of course, uh, Jerusalem falls. But ultimately... The victory will be the Lord's yet in the future. And so he says uh, here that the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations of the land. Uh, verse 17, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. We might say paper today because most of our gods are not wood and stone. Rather, they are uh, paper, that is the dollar. And maybe a little bit later, it's just going to be bits of information on a computer. And so we see that uh, our idols have moved from wood and stone to uh, to sand and cellulose and, uh, and uh, whatever you consider what is part of the tech in industry. So they have destroyed them. And now, O oh Lord, our God, I pray, deliver us from the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou alone art Lord, our God. Oh, Lord, our God. So basically, this is what we do in a crisis. I don't care what the crisis is. Then, now, anytime, always prayer is the order of the day. And any king or people or individual who do not pray 
for deliverance in a crisis, whether the deliverance comes or not, because God, of course, ultimately can decide whether we are to be taken home to be with him or to live through and to be victorious. Many times the victory is held. We saw a specific victory under Daniel uh, and under uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the other kings in Babylon. For example, when the uh, uh, children were in the fiery furnace uh, before they went in, the king said that that was their punishment for not worshiping him and falling down before him as everyone else had done. Everyone capitulated to the king and fell down and worshiped the golden idol of Nebuchadnezzar, except for three, the three uh, children of Israel. And they, of course, were cast into the fiery furnace. And before they did, he said, do you know what's going to happen to you? And they said, well, whether the Lord delivers us or not, he's still the Lord. And we're not falling down and worshiping your ridiculous statue. And that's that. And so here were people who understood they might lose their life, but they were not going to lose their eternal soul by worshiping a pagan deity. And so whether we are delivered physically in this life or whether we are delivered through the rapture or taken home through uh, through physical death, in combat, or some other adversity, the Lord is still in charge. He still has a plan for us, and the future pales into insignificance anything that we go through in this life. Hard to do, easy to say, but nevertheless true. And so here he is praying that the Lord will deliver him, and so God answers him. Now, we're not going to give the whole answer here. You can read it at your leisure. And so the Lord uh, says here, uh, uh, then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Specifics. This is a principle. When you pray, be specific. Uh, I mean, sometimes when we don't know the situation some individual uh, or organization is involved in, we pray in generality. But when we can, we need to pray specifically, and here he has a specific request for deliverance from Assyria and Sennacherib. I have heard you. This is the word of the Lord has spoken against him. And then verse 21, going all the way down, uh, actually, uh, then verse 32, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. And so he finishes up here and verse 34, he says, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake. And for my servant David's sake, obviously God is delivering it for his own reasons. And in this case, because obviously Jerusalem is his nation, it is his king, I mean, it is his uh, capital. As a matter of fact, those of you who have studied when we did the Millennial Kingdom or the brief on the kingdom, Jerusalem will be the capital city in the kingdom. Not only the capital of Jerusalem, but it'll be the world capital during that future kingdom. So Jerusalem is truly the eternal city. It is the city that God said, I'm going to put my name there. It's my city. And anybody that attacks Jerusalem has to answer to God, just like anyone who attacks the Hebrew people has to answer to God. They are, the scripture says, the pupil of God's eye. That's where we get the word apple of the eye. In the Hebrew, it's not an apple at all. That's the idiom that has come from it, but it's actually the pupil of the eye. And so you can see if you stick your finger in someone's eye, right in the pupil, it hurts. Uh, you can destroy someone's vision very easily by poking your finger into the pupil of their eye. And uh, Israel and Jerusalem is basically the pupil of God's eye. If you like apple, but uh, I like apples, but that's not what it says in the original Hebrew. So we have the answer there. So we have the answer in 2 Kings 19, 20 to 34. And then uh, we're going to come back in just a moment and look at the victories. But the victory is over Sennacherib is found in verse 35 through 37. We'll look at it in just a moment. Then we go over to 2 Chronicles. Go over to 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles 32. Now, again, much of the same material is here, held here or had is seen here. But uh, we won't do all of it. We just want to look at verse 20. And so in verse 20, it says, But King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed 
about this and cried out to heaven. That's all we have for the prayer there. We saw the prayer over there extended over in 2 Kings 19. Here it just says that they, that they prayed. That's all we have. And then we have the victory. We'll look at that in just a moment. And so the victory is in verse 21 and 22. But we have no specifics of the prayer. We have to go back to 2 Kings 19 uh, in order to get the prayer and the answer in 5 through 34, as we noted. And then one more time, and this is over in Isaiah 37. So in Isaiah 37, 15, Isaiah 37, 15, and here we do have the prayer, uh, uh, a, a, a similar version in most cases, and it says, And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who art enthroned above the cherubim, thou art the God, thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. So you see much of the same. And then the fact that Sennacherib has uh, been a reproach to the living God in verse 17. And then it says that he has devastated all the countries around and cast their idols into the fire. And verse 20, and now, O Lord God, deliver us from the hand, uh, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou alone art God. And so we have that information in terms of the prayer found here in 15 through 21. So we have it spelled out in two places in Isaiah 37, where the prophet remembers it, also the writer of Kings, and then in Chronicles, simply a reference to it. The second thing then are the victories over Assyria. So now let's go back and we'll come back through again in 2 Kings 19 and 35. 2 Kings 19. 35. Now, of course, we talked about verse 34 was the closing of the prayer, or the answer to the prayer that God gave, starting in verse 21. So in 35, it says, then it happened. In other words, the prayer was answered. And so right here in the next verse, it says, then it happened that night. Now, that's service. <laughs> that's service on a prayer, I'll tell you what. I wish we had that service today. Maybe we will. So don't give up heart. Uh, don't faint. But rather continue prayer. Prevailing prayer will deliver our nation and will deliver us individually from the evil that is besetting our country and the evil people. And so he says, it happened that night that the angel of the Lord, this is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a study of the angel of Jehovah found at the website. You can look that up. The angel of the Lord, angel of Jehovah is a, a an Old Testament reference, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before he took on human form through the virgin birth and became the Jesus that we understand uh, in his humanity. Before that, he appeared as an angel, the angel of Jehovah. And so he appeared as the angel of, of the Lord, uh, Jehovah in the in the Hebrew, it is the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-V-H. -H. Uh, the Lord refers to the ever-existing one. And so the angel of the ever-existing one, we might say, the Lord, it says here, and he struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, uh, all of them were dead bodies. Someone was wondering if that was when Israel got up. Well, certainly it was when Israel got up, but the antecedent for the word uh, uh, here, they have this word men, but in the Hebrew, it's they. And what we call the antecedent would be the uh, phrase or word that declares earlier, and then they would refer back to the 185,000. So they mustered uh, out into uh, the formation, what we would call the roll call, when you come out uh, of your billets in the morning and you stand at attention and they check to see, is everyone here all present accounted for, sir? E each of the companies in the battalion was all present accounted for, sir? And they go right down the list. And, of course, uh, they fell out. I should say they fell in and then they fell out and they were all dead. And that's what it says. And so when they arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead bodies just standing right there in the track. They were just dead. I guess if they were dead, they just fell over then. And so all these guys that were in formation getting ready to fight, uh, just uh, dead bodies fell over. And so the whole company, 80, 185,000 uh, until the 
second advent when Jesus Christ destroys the armies of Antichrist, this is possibly the greatest kill in the Old Testament. So much for the God who is a God of love. He certainly loves those who love him, but those who hate him, those who mock and malign God, he destroys them physically and then spiritually by placing them in the lake of fire forever and ever, also known as outer darkness, not a place that any of us will ever have to go to. And so it says, so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, left. He didn't die, but everybody in his army did, so <laughs> nothing left but to go home. And he returned home and lived in Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh, that sounds familiar. Uh, that's a place where Nimrod went after the Babylon uh, uh, building project failed. You know, the Tower of Babel, that failed, so he left town. <laughs> And he went to Nineveh and established that. And so here we have Sennacherib, uh, another evil person like Nimrod, and he goes to uh, Nineveh. And it came about, you'll remember, Jonah went to Nineveh too, but that's another story. At any rate, it came about that he was worshiping in the house of uh, uh uh, is that right? Nishrak, the god, in other words, a pagan deity, uh, and of course, uh, two of his uh, uh, two of his compatriots there killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And Ezra, Ezra Haddon, his son, became king in his place. So we have the destruction described here as part of the victory and noted the 185,000 specifically. That's also mentioned over in Isaiah. In Second Chronicles, no specific number is mentioned. Let's look at Second Chronicles 32. Second Chronicles 32:21. Here it's a, this is an abbreviated form. Note it just said there that Hezekiah and Isaiah, the prophet, prayed. The next verse said he got an answer. Now we have a little more of that information over in 2 Kings and Isaiah. Here it's just abbreviated. That's why I say these put all together gives us a total picture. And the Lord sent the angel who destroyed every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the camp of the king of Assyria. Now, I didn't kill the king of Assyria, but he did kill, apparently, Rob Chaka and the other two generals and all the warriors. So it says all the warriors, the commander, that'd be Rob Shaka, and the two other officers with him and uh, in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned in shame to his own land. That's, of course, uh, 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 Sennacherib, sorry. And when he had entered the temple of his god, we had the name of it in the other chapter. Some of his own children killed him uh, with a sword. And uh, the Lord saved Hezekiah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them uh, on and guarded them on every side. So they had freedom through military victory. In this case, the military victory was accomplished by God. Sometimes we have to fight, and freedom always comes through military victory. The enemy has to be destroyed. If you can't win them to the Lord, they have to be destroyed. You cannot compromise with evil. Evil must be destroyed. I know it's hard today because everything we do is a compromise. We have to capitulate and compromise with everybody. We cannot compromise with evil. We cannot compromise with evil nations. We should not and... Uh, uh, unfortunately, we have in the past in this country given arms and weapons to our enemies. Uh, we're still in the process of doing that. This is an evil practice uh, by any nation, and our nation has been found guilty of this along with many other violations of the principles of leadership found in the Word of God. So that's in Second Chronicles. And then once again, over to Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37. And now we just look at uh, uh, Isaiah 37, verse 33 through 38. 37, 3, 33 through 38. In Isaiah 37, 33, Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. Neither shall he come before it with shield, nor throw up a mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he'll return, and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And then he says in verse 36, Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 Assyrian um, infantry in the camp 
of the Assyrians. And when the men arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead bodies. Again, same phrase, almost verbatim. And we see that this 185,000 is secure as a number, both by the writer that we have noted here in 2 Kings and Isaiah the prophet. So two mouths confirm the literal a deliverance and destruction of 185,000 infantry, including Rob Shaka, other generals that were part of it. Sennacherib himself escaped, and it says uh, he departed and returned and lived in Nineveh. And this is somewhere he lived till about 681 BC. Uh, and it came about that when he was worshiping, that uh, his kids that were mentioned here specifically that actually took his own life. So we have this is the victories. Now we come to letter J. If you have your outline there, you can see letter J says, Hezekiah became proud and failed to be thankful to the Lord for this great victory and all the gifts he received from the nations round about, and he became mortally ill. Now, this is the problem. Sometimes you have a great victory from the Lord, and then you begin to make the mistake of thinking that it was your victory, that somehow because you were a great leader, you brought about the victory, even if he were the general in charge of the combat, which he was not. He really was just woke up in the morning and all the Assyrian infantry were dead. So he had no part in this one. But even if he did, the victory is the Lord's. But somehow he began to think in terms of the fact that he was perhaps invincible and pride overcame him. We must be careful whenever we have a victory from the Lord, however small or great it is. It is the Lord's victory, and we must be thankful to the Lord and give him all the praise and honor. He will honor us if and when he decides to, and if God promotes us, then we're promoted. If uh, he does not, then we're not. We do not promote ourselves. We do not become arrogant about a victory, especially when the Lord has won the victory for us. And so we see here that uh, the pride comes into play. And so we go back now to 2 Kings. Go back to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Now we saw the last part of this up in chapter 19 where the 185,000 Assyrian infantry were killed by the angel of the Lord. In the next verse, in chapter 20, verse 1, in those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you will die and not live. Now, they don't explain what happened here. It's explained in the other chronicle uh, when we get to it. But the fact is that he became arrogant. The nations round about were scared to death, <laughs> which you might understand. And they brought tribute to him. And he had all this great wealth and great prosperity. And it was like, my, I'm so wealthy. And, of course, uh, the pride began to well up in him. And so he got sick. And he got sick unto death. Now, it doesn't tell us that here. It tells us that in the Chronicles. We'll get to it in a moment. At any rate, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Isaiah tells him, you're going <laughs> to, I hate to say it, you're going to die because of your pride, basically. Uh, and so some of the commentary suggests that this happened before the Assyrian invasion. And so there is a difference of opinion. I think this happened as a result of his pride that occurred after. And I think I can substantiate that. And uh, Wolverd Zuck in their commentary concur with my uh, estimation. And then he turned his face to the wall. And guess what? He prayed. Well, uh, when you get ill, whatever it is, uh, prayer is the order of the day. Uh, many people have had uh, the uh, virus that has come along here in recent years, and uh, they have prayed. And so prayer is number one. You might have all of the medication that's available, all of the good things that we know that you can uh, utilize. Nevertheless, ultimately, the Lord will deliver you or he will take you home. And so he prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept, wept bitterly. 
Now, of course, he has, except a little bit of pride in there. Uh, and so we sometimes don't notice that. We think, oh, I've done all these things for you, God. I'm such a great person because I've done all these things for you. Well, whatever we do for the Lord, we do under his ministry and with his spirit and his word. Uh, it's still not us doing the work, especially today because we have the indwelling and enabling of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, he prayed and it came about as Isaiah had gone out of the middle uh, out of the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying return and say to Hezekiah the leader of my people this is Isaiah uh, thus says the Lord the God of your father David I have heard your prayer now does God hear our prayer always does he always answer yes does he always answer the way we want no because sometimes God has an alternative plan that's better than our plan and uh, we can't see that Hindsight is, as they say in the uh, proverb, is always, uh, uh, what, what is the proverb? Hindsight is always what? 2020, all right. So, um, but uh, here it says, they heard his prayer, and I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you will go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. Now there it seems like this occurred before the king of Assyria came. And so uh, that's the suggestion. But it also and elsewhere seems to indicate it was after the fact. So whether it was before the fact of the Assyrian invasion and the destruction of the 185,000 infantry or after it, it nevertheless was an illness unto death. And the Lord gave him 15 more days. I'm sorry, 15 more years, 15 more years. And of course, uh, I will defend this city for my own sake, as he said. And Isaiah said, and then, then he tells him to take some cakes of figs. And of course, figs are uh, represent prosperity. And they took it and laid it on the boil and he recovered. So here it was used as a medicinal uh, purpose for medicinal purposes. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the house of the Lord in the third day? And Isaiah said, this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken and shall shadow, shall the shadow go forth 10 steps or go back 10 steps. Major, major miracle coming up. And the scholars have debated this for years. Scientists have tried to figure this out. And so here it is. Hezekiah answered, well, it's easy for the shadow to decline 10 steps. That is, the sun goes down. And the uh, sign on the sundial uh, would actually show that it would go down uh, on the steps. The sundial was, uh, uh, was seen as the sun was going down. It made a shadow on the steps. And as it would go down, it would go down several steps. And it's easy for the shadow to go down 10 steps, he says, uh, but let the shadow go backwards 10 steps. In other words, the sun's going down, but he wants the shadow to go in the reverse order. Now, that's a miracle. Uh, we would have to say that the earth would have to stop rotation, which is impossible. God would have to alter some features uh, of uh, the universe in order for this to happen. And obviously, he didn't do that. So some of the uh, hypotheses with regard to this are the fact that somehow God altered a refraction of the sun's rays in this area in the atmosphere so that in fact the shadow did go backwards instead of forward. And so uh, this is the miracle that was uh, done and however the Lord did it he didn't stop the planet from revolving of course and the shadow didn't actually uh, in any other place to go down but apparently there was some type of refraction in the atmosphere and the bending of light such that the shadow went back 10 steps. And of course, it says, Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow on the stairway back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the staircase of Ahaz. This was the steps of Ahaz they'd built. At the time, of course, you see that this was uh, going to be delivered. And so he goes through this whole thing. And Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah, verse 14, and said to him, what did these men say? Now, what we have is in the next section, and I want to come back to this. I don't know if we're going to have time, but this is the next time. And so it breaks off right after verse 11. And, of course, the, uh, the Lord delivered them, certainly from the Assyrians. And he also delivered him from this 
mortal illness that he had. Then another mistake, which is going to be his final failure, and we'll come back to that probably next class, and that begins in verse 12 uh, down through 19. And once again, he had just gotten over uh, pride, of course, I believe, because of the victory over the Assyrians. Some would say maybe this is the same failure. Either way, it was a case of pride. It seems to be in the Chronicles two separate incidents, and so uh, here it seems to be one. So it's kind of hard to determine, and the scholars do have an issue here, but uh, don't let that change your salvation at all. At any rate, we have the uh, victory here uh, over the Assyrians, and then we have the failure starting in 2 Kings 20. Now let's go to 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Chronicles 32 and 23 through 26. Now we already have the destruction of the mighty men and verse 22 says, and the Lord saved Hezekiah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others and guided them, guarded them on every side. And many were bringing gifts to the Lord, uh, to the Lord at Jerusalem and choice presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah so that he became exalted in the sight of all the nations around. In those days, he became mortally ill. So it seems that there is an arrogance as a result after the victory, and he becomes ill here, it says, after the victory. Now, we do know that the Assyrians attacked several times, and so we have different versions, and uh, I don't know that we can ever totally reconcile it this side of glory, but we do know that he had this area of difficulty, of pride. And then, of course, uh, the mortal illness, he prayed to the Lord in verse 24, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. That's the sign of the shadow going back 10 steps rather than forward. And Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received. That is because his heart was proud. So he got uh, delivered. He had deliverance from the Assyrians. Uh, he was delivered from this mortal illness. And yet he still had pride that crept in uh, because of his wealth. It says, therefore, his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him uh, and on Judah and Jerusalem. However... Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart and both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. All right, so we have here the first, what I believe is the first test and failure of Hezekiah, which was his pride. Uh, in Isaiah 38, 1 to 22, we'll skip that. He talk, It talks there about his mortal illness once again and uh, the uh, fact that he was delivered through prayer. Then we have the last and final test. And so go back now to 2 Kings 20, 12. 2 Kings 20. Here it says... It says, at that time, Baradak, Baladan, the son of uh, Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. He sent him a good will card. Get well card. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hear you're feeling much better. Uh, and so he butters him up. And what he wants is to find out how much wealth he's got. And so uh, it says Hezekiah listened to him and he showed him all the house treasures, the silver and the gold and the spices and all the precious oil and all the armor in his house and uh, everything that he found of his treasures. And there was nothing in his house nor in his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, Babylon is going to come down and destroy the southern kingdom in 586 B.C. Naughty, naughty Hezekiah, shut up your mouth because you're giving away the store. And so the Babylonians are going to come. They know you have this. And so basically, <coughs> they send him this get well card, and, uh, and he buys into the fact that they're his friends. And so uh, they come, and he shows them all the treasures. And Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what, what did these men say? And from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, oh, they come from a far country, from Babylon. Oh, I'm just about out of time, and I'm at the good part here. Uh, and so basically, and he says, 
what what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah said, they've seen all that was in my house. There is nothing among the treasures that I have not shown them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the words of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, all that your fathers have laid up there in store all these days uh, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who shall come and issue from you, you shall beget. They shall be taken away and they shall become officials. Listen to this. In the palace of the king of Babylon, Daniel and his three friends are mentioned here prophetically in the kings. And this happens uh, long before the time that it actually occurred. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord, which he has spoken uh, is good. For he thought, it isn't going to happen in my days. It'll be peace in my days. He already had that, uh, so he didn't care about the future. Uh, this was his uh, grievous mistake. Well, uh, this is his second and final failure because he has pride once again. And so we'll have to come back because of time, and we'll look at that last failure. Uh, and you see that's down there, M, in your outline. King failed the final test of humility. No matter how much good we do, if we have arrogance and pride in our heart, in our life, in the things that we do, we cannot ultimately have the blessing of God. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity of studying this great man. Recognize that even the greatness of leadership and these great men had an old sin nature, and therefore we have to guard against pride. We have to guard against thinking that what we have accomplished is something that we have done on our own strength rather than through the ministry of your Holy Spirit and under your word. Help us to give thanks to you, Father, for all that we have, all that we say, all that we do, and all that we will become in the future. We thank you for all these marvelous things. And for that one person who's here today, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that God had you in mind when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for the sins of the whole world. My sins, your sins, everyone's sins. Once and for all time, he died. He paid the price. He satisfied the just demand of the Father. And if you believe in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross as being the substitutionary atoning work to provide for your sins and to give you salvation, you have eternal life. You have forgiveness of sins you will have a resurrection body in the future and live in the palace with Jesus Christ forevermore don't you want to do that before you leave believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved father again we're so grateful for this opportunity we've had to study these passages in history so that we are those who will obey the things that were done correctly and honoring you in history and not do those things that were failing and disobedient to you. We pray all these things in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm.